organization will say that leadership is important to them. Mm -hmm. Almost none have formalized leadership training. When people quit, over 70% of the time, they're actually quitting their manager and not the organization they work for. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propello Media. And on today's Ask an Expert, I'm going to be speaking with Marina Besanova, who is the co-founder of a headhunting firm called Pronexia. And they use an innovative approach to focus on the organizational culture for their human-to-human -human approach to hiring. Today, she's going to give you some some hiring techniques that you can adopt. She's also going to talk about how you can leverage social media, and she's going to share some inspiring things she's seeing in today's market. With that, let's get started. All right, Marina, I would like to welcome you to our Ask an Expert uh, vodcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to it. All right, so I'm gonna jump right in. We're gonna talk about the firm that you co-founded. Um, what I love about it is it takes a different approach. Um, you have a tagline that says it's human to human headhunting. Can you talk about that? Yes, absolutely, and thank you for asking. Um, so, you know, um, it's been already a few years um, since marketers have realized that um, the whole B2B versus B2C concept is faulty. At the end of the day, we're not really selling to consumers, um, you know, people versus uh, companies. Um, within those companies, it's also right. humans making decisions, right? So it's human to human. In hiring, however, we haven't adopted that approach, um, number one. And also number two, um, you know, and there's a lot of, um, you know, rhetoric around that human resources tends not yeah. to be the most human of departments within within an organization okay. um, so we're we're bringing that touch back to it and also the whole concept of h2h -H. okay um so let's talk about this a little bit deeper um because i know one of the components that you guys do is you don't just say okay company x is looking for an employee you guys dig deeper to talk about the culture of that organization um can you walk me through the first what's the importance of that and then what is the process you guys do for that yeah, so we help companies uncover their um, unique value proposition as an employer. And that's very important. We started this uh, when the market was quite different also than it is right now. Right now, the angle of what we do with companies differs uh, because of the pandemic. But when we started uh, diving deep with companies into company culture, company culture assessments a couple of years ago, um, we were in the middle of a war for talent, which was only intensifying, right? The tables right. have, uh, you know, it's, it's shifted a little bit or quite a bit for the time being. Uh, but so for an organization to be able to attract top talent, um, and especially, you know, when you're running a smaller organization, you don't have all the budget to be throwing out those huge salaries and perks and competing, you know, with the Googles in your town. Um, so what you can do, though, is identify what is it that's unique about your organization. We do a deep dive into companies, um, companies' culture, its mission, and then we'll look at all of the different pillars uh, from community engagement to internal communications, all of those different things to identify the strengths of an organization to yeah. build its unique value proposition as an employer on the basis of it so that then you do attract the right employees. You might even attract people um, who you think, you know, would only want to work at Google and then they don't because you align on all of those different things that matter to them. So let's talk about, I saw on your, your guys' site, um, you talk about actually hiring kind of for, and this gets back to the people for people, but hiring to that manager. Because I think there is some stat on there, people don't quit companies, they quit managers. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, and how interesting, right? We see that people will go into so much detail, research in the organization they're going to be working for. Right. Um, they don't research the boss, and then 80% of people end up quitting the boss, as you said, right? So there's irony. So we certainly, number one, uh, when we're working with organizations, we're really creating that match between two people. Look, it doesn't always stick because the person doesn't stay in that managerial role, right? So sometimes... Right. You join for this leader and then you're working for somebody else. However, at least at the beginning to make sure that there is that match, very important. Um, so that's number one. And also number two, you know, what we realized, Josh, um, auditing a lot of organizations is that every organization will say that leadership is important to them. Mm -hmm. Almost none have formalized leadership training. So another thing that we started doing for organizations is creating leadership programs so that we can help ensure that, you know, we're elevating internal leaders and then we're making matches that are actually going to stick once they hire somebody. 
Okay, and that's a great aspect. Um, and I, I kind of love this well rounded approach. It's not just like, hey, here's a candidate, they have these, you know, this set of experience, so it'll be a good fit for you guys. Um, when you go into a company, and it's you, you've identified the culture, and you've identified, um, you know, the manager, are you, you know, and, and I guess, take a step back, they say, hey, we're looking for uh, a biz dev person, or we're looking for, um, you know, a creative director. Do you sometimes pivot what they're looking for? Do you say, hey, I know you said you were looking for X, but based upon what we've evaluated after looking at your organization, talking to the manager, we really think you actually need something different than that. All the time. And uh, we're fortunate to have developed deep relationships with our clients where they trust us, trust us and understand that we are their consultants and we have right. the deeper understanding of who they are and what they need. Um, so number one, as far as the actual, you know, description of tasks that they had created and pivoting that, yes. Um, but also very often um, pivoting what they think the fit will be as far as, you know, the type of personality, the person they're looking for. Example, um, you know, if you're asking, what are you looking for in a person? Mm -hmm. Okay. Usually everybody will say very similar rhetoric. If we're talking about soft skills, right? I'm looking for somebody who's autonomous. I'm looking for somebody who's a self-starter, uh, entrepreneurial, intrapreneurial. It's all the same things, right? We like to shift that question. Okay. So the shift, instead of what are you looking for and getting those standards, we ask, what are your pet peeves? In an, in an employee, okay? Right. And then very often, for example, very recently, one of my clients said, I don't like people who um, will just do things without asking questions. I'd rather you come and ask me a million times a day instead of just going with things and then we have to redo stuff. Sure. Well, what does that tell me? Yeah. That's a micromanager, right? Yeah. So I know I'm not gonna send somebody who's really autonomous and self-motivated, <laughs> that person's gonna, right? So that's yeah. what I know. But had I asked, you know, what are you looking for? Well, of course, I'm looking for somebody who's autonomous, self-motivated, driven, etc. Yeah. Everybody says the same thing. So yes, we pivot not only job descriptions all the time, rewrite job descriptions for clients all the time, uh -huh. um, but also you know pivot those soft skills that they usually say they're they're looking for. Well, I like that because I I think. You know, from a creative standpoint, and I've dabbled a little bit, but it's it's hard when you're talking about a design or a concept. You're, it's hard to say what you like about something. It's more easy to say what you don't like about something. And so that's a great way to flip the approach is like, okay, no, let's focus on the pet peeves. What are the things you don't like? And that puts you in a better position to make sure you find the right candidate. Um, so kudos to you guys to, to kind of flip that. Um, what kind of hiring trends are you seeing in the marketplace right now? It's bad. <laughs> right. So listen, <laughs> good news, bad news. Um, bad news for job seekers, right? The highest unemployment rate we've seen in a very long time. Good news for companies that are able to hire. If you are able to hire, you will be able right now, right now get the best talent um, that maybe as an SMB without all the bells and whistles, you would have never been able to attract before. Right. Um, we're seeing, of course, slowly as some of the, um, you know, industries are opening up, some of the companies are opening up. Slowly, we're seeing um, hiring restart, but it's trending towards contractual roles instead of permanent, which uh -huh. is what we also saw during the last almost recession of 2008 and 9. Right. More so now because of that sense uh, of we don't know what to expect, right? Is this going yeah. to happen again in the fall, in the winter? Um, easier to hire people for temporary roles. Or we're seeing that a lot more companies are hiring people for roles that are hands-on execution and will kind of bring that ROI right away versus executive roles that take, you know, minimum six months to a year um, yeah, to bring invest. return on investment. And then right. there's a risk because well, who knows what the future holds. Um, so those are some of the trends. Gig economy, of course, is revving up <laughs> like never before. Yeah, right. Um, well, so talking about, you know, kind of this tumultuous environment that we're in, um, I have a couple of questions related to this, right? Because we are facing, you know, when we first started the series a few months ago, it was a pandemic, um, and then the economy tanked, and then there's suddenly social unrest. And so, you know, we're in this, this perfect storm of, of just uncertainty. Um, and so uh, the first thing that is more tactical is video which is something that people have been talking about forever, has been thrust in front of everybody. It's become a necessity, um, which to me has been fantastic because it's broken down this facade. Um, you're in Canada, I'm in America, we're thousands of miles apart and we're talking um, as if we were right next to each other. So 
how are you seeing companies use this today? And how do you think, whether it's you guys or what you're seeing from companies, how do you think that they will continue or evolve to use more video um, now that we've kind of broken through this, this facade? Yeah, you know, I don't think that um, it's a black and white response because you're seeing a lot of predictions and we saw them, especially at the beginning and also mid pandemic. Oh, no, all of the companies are going to go remote. All of the companies are going to do this. No, what happened during the pandemic is that everything got accelerated. Companies that were trending towards remote have right. gone remote. We okay. have been talking about going remote. We are getting rid of our office right now. That's what my firm is doing. But okay. we had been talking about it. Companies, I'm seeing my clients who said, no, we're anti-working from home policy. We always said that for years. They're, they're forcing their people back no matter what. You know, schools are closed, daycares are closed, but they're still forcing their people back. So right. it's we're in a period of acceleration. What was going to happen has happened. Yes, of course, um, companies have had to adapt and, you know, start doing uh, video interviews, but only the ones, again, that were already on that track, right? right. Um, and it's also made things really hard for more senior candidates, right? Same with job seekers who are not used to, didn't have that time to slowly adapt to it, are yeah. struggling and coaching a lot of people on how to interview on Zoom and what to do and kind of where to look and, you know, what to do. You can't rely on your body language and it's awkward and all of those things. Um, so I think the trend businesses that were not ready for this, um, not from the physical, you know, logistical standpoint, just mentally not ready for this. They're using this as proof that it doesn't work. Right. Oh. Because this wasn't working for them to begin with. They're saying, right. see, told you, you know, we're having issues. Um, people will, you know, have youth confirmation bias in a situation like this as well. Okay. Um, well, so let's take a little bit further about what you were talking about as far as some people struggling. What type of tips do you have for people that are using this new medium um, as they're going through a hiring process? You mean clients? Yeah. You know, I think empathy is really important. I think right. it's important to realize that um, this is awkward for a lot of job seekers and that we are also going through an intense period of stress, right? Um, right. Somebody was just asking me, said, you know, I was interviewing a candidate and he, he, he kept looking up instead of making eye contact. Um, do you think he was lying? Do you think he was being insincere? Um, and I said, you know, well, first of all, that's anecdotal to begin with, you know, when people look up yeah, or right. left, right? Like it's kind of anecdotal. But even more so now, right? I said, he likely was stressed and uncomfortable and was very in his head and trying to think very hard, right? Um, so I think we can't use the same, you know, assessment tools that we're used to um, and just, you know, judge people. So that would be number one. Number two also, um, I mean, the, the process, the recruitment process is already broken and awkward to begin with. So to make it as comfortable as possible. You know, I have some clients who insist on doing panel interviews it's hard. You know, we're, we're always sitting in meetings where like, oh, sorry, you're talking, I'm talking, oh, no, you go ahead, you go ahead, no, oh, oh, you, oh, it's okay, sorry, you're on mute, you're on mute. When you do that in an interview setting that is already awkward for the it's person, very um, you're just not going to see them at their best, right? You're not right. going to get the true essence. So I would say um, approaching with empathy and making it as smooth as possible um, really is, uh, is essential. It's crucial right now. Okay. Um, so shifting gears and still talking about the environment we're in, um, I'd like to compliment you and your firm um, for having a very diverse organization. Um, and obviously, this is something that a lot of corporations are looking at now. So I wanted to know, is this something that you guys talk to um, or address with companies as you're working to, to find them talent? Mm -hmm. What a timely question, Josh. Just yesterday, <laughs> I hosted um, a diversity and inclusion, diversity and inclusion and belonging panel for my clients. Okay. Um, and it was incredible. So, you know, as you mentioned, um, you know, because of the pandemic, we have a lot more access to each other geographically, right? You're in yeah. the States, I'm in Canada. Um, a panel yesterday, we had um, a speaker from Google who is in Singapore. We had uh, a professor in California. Uh, we had a Hall of Fame speaker from the States as well. So just very extremely diverse. Um, yes, we are talking to um, clients about diversity. It's extremely important, but not just, you know, well, hire 
uh, diversity. It's just not enough. The question is um, talking about also inclusion and talking about belonging. So one of the things that we started doing, as I mentioned to you, we help companies not just hiring, but with programs. Because right. just hiring is not enough. It's, it's yeah. the deeper stuff around it, right? So same as we do culture assessment, same as we help companies build leadership training, leadership programs, we've started helping companies build DNI programs as well. Yeah. Um, so we're not just, again, talking about um, diversity. Um, we're, we're, we're going deeper and bigger than that. Okay, well, it's that's fantastic to hear. Um, I feel, you know, having gone through some... Some social, you know, uprisings and, you know, trends like this definitely feels different. And I feel like corporations are much more receptive to it. Um, mm -hmm. But it's great to have somebody, you know, that's actually giving them guidance on how not to just do it, you know, how not to make it just lip service. So, um, mm -hmm. okay. So you lecture um, on social media ROI specifically about personal brand. Um, I, I was intrigued by this. So I'd love to hear more about that. Oh, ho, ho, how much time do we have? <laughs> we, we've got all day if you want, so. <laughs> I do. What would you like to know? What's, what's of interest to you when it comes to personal branding? Well, so let's just talk about it. Um, well, I guess when I read that, social media, right? So social media is this weird hybrid environment, right? Because it's I'm putting my personal state out there, but I'm doing it in a public forum and obviously unless mm -hmm. I've privatized it. So explain how you leverage or how you develop this personal brand um, and what I guess what the benefit is, I would ask you, is this personal brand for me as an individual or is this personal brand for a career that I'm, you know, I'm hoping to get into? everything has become the new normal. Um, you know, we used to have the exact same discussions exactly 10 years ago when companies were deciding whether or not they should be on social media. And it was the same discussions, right? We had a lot of people saying, well, but what kind of companies is this for? Or, ah, it's not really for me. Oh, it's not our thing, right? We were having these exact same discussions. Um, and now it's the same for all companies, right? Arguably, or the ones that are still around. Um, it's become the same for a personal brand. So if we're talking specifically, um, for, you know, small, medium-sized business owners, entrepreneurs, because, you know, the different um, ROI on the different benefits, uh, depending on what you're doing. Um, I can talk from personal experience. So running, scaling um, my firm, uh, when we got to our seven figures in revenue year four, we said, you know what, we now want to have some social proof. We want to be in the media. We're hiring a PR firm, okay? We felt that this was the time to get that exposure. Um, hired a PR firm 10 months in, um, got a media mention, one. Now it was in the financial post, so it was a good one, but it was one. And then I said, you know what, I'm going to, as you know, an entrepreneur usually does, I'm going to take it into my own hands and I'm going to start, you know, just using the platforms myself for my own voice. I'm going to start branding myself as a thought leader in the hiring and company culture space. And then as a result in the background, my business will be mentioned as well. Sure. Um, I got myself and their business into Forbes.com, Inc.com, Success Magazine, SaaS Company, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. First page um, Google search for a headhunting firm. It's a really crowded, overly crowded, overly saturated space. Yeah. Uh, page one of Google search organically, just because we had all these blogs and websites, et cetera, pointing to us. It was completely organic through uh, authority ranking. Um, got all of that. So the benefits are, um, if you are a smaller business, um, at the very least, massive exposure. Um, because if you want to get exposure for a business page, you've got to put a ton of um, ad dollars behind it, right? right. Uh, whereas personal pages, you don't, right? On LinkedIn, you can easily stand out and carve out a niche for yourself. Whereas if you try doing it for, for your business page, that's a lot of money and a lot of effort. Sure. Um, and one final thing, I mean, look, 90, what was the last uh, time I checked the numbers? 96% of people um, don't trust uh, messages from brands versus trusting mm. messages that they see from other people, even people they don't know. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So if I write on, you know, Marina Bajanova said on hiring versus Pernexia said that are on hiring, uh, people will trend on trusting me versus my corporate brand. Okay. So, which uh, I totally can validate, right? I mean, we do trust people because it's a person, right? It's just not some static, you know, logo. Um, 
as far as putting this content out there, um, I feel, and I can personally attest to this, content is just like, it's like this bear, like you just, you just avoid it at all costs because it just seems like a slog. Um, what recommendations or what tips do you have for people to, um, to, to maintain a schedule, um, but to me, more importantly, to be authentic, right? To not just mm -hmm. be like, oh, I, I guess I should talk about this because this is what people are saying, but really keep their authentic voice. What a great question. And one of the things that I've started working with people on is helping them find their voice. That's the first part. Before you start scaling the reach of your voice, you need to identify what your voice is. So there's a lot of work that goes into that first. You have to identify, well, what is your unique value proposition, right? What are you bringing into the market? What is unique about you? Um, be that you as a job seeker, you as a professional in a certain area, whatever aspect of yourself you're trying to brand, whatever goal you have. So your unique value proposition, number one. Number two, well, what is your brand voice, right? We need to identify that as well. And that a lot of people, most people don't know. So as they start posting or writing, usually they will try to imitate somebody, right? They have a lot of people saying, Marina, I love what you're doing with your personal brand. I just don't want to do that. That's not for me, so I'm not going to do it. Well, no, because you're not me, right? I'm loud. I'm outspoken. I'm Eastern European. A lot of things have gone into forming who I am. You're very different, right? So if you try uh, to sound like me, it, it, it won't work out, right? Sure. And then I give people very different examples. You look, for example, at a Gary Vaynerchuk, who's yeah. extremely loud and in your face, right? Yeah. Liked by some, not by others. And then you see Simon Sinek, who is equally as popular, has a big <laughs> following, but he's more intellectual, he's quieter, very, very, he's not yeah. in your face. Right. Very different, right? So you need to identify your brand voice so that you're comfortable and then you're going to be authentic because you're comfortable with your voice. Then also you need to identify well, what will be your platforms, right? It's not all LinkedIn. Um, it's not all Facebook. What is right for you? Because again, if the platform is right, it will feel authentic to you. Um, and then also what motivates somebody to keep posting and the schedule you mentioned, et cetera, is knowing why you're doing it. What's your goal, right? If you start sure. posting for the sake of posting, don't. A lot of people are doing that. Um, but if you have a goal and you've identified, you know, what it is that you're bringing to the market that's unique, it will stand out. Less than 1% of people post frequently on LinkedIn. Yeah. Um, less than 1%. So the possibility of standing out once you have done all that pre-work is immense. And what's frequently? How often should people be, be getting out there? Oh, now I'm going to scare people because the answer is every day. Um, but okay, I will say if you're going to do less than three times a week, then don't. Then just yeah. don't at all. Okay, yeah. and then you're not ready. Three, three times a week is the absolute minimum, but ideally every single day. That's good advice. Um, so I read, uh, I read about you guys, you leveraged uh, a quote from Steve Jobs. Um, and so I want to talk about this, just share it with the audience, but A-list people hire A-list people. Uh, B-list people hire C-list people, C-list people hire D-list people, so on and so on. And so the focus for you guys is, hey, we want to we wanna stay in this A-list. We want to really focus on the top. Um, as we look out to college students or even high school students, um, what advice do you have as an individual to elevate themselves to become an A-list person? Um, definitely growth mindset, um, being able to be in that absolute constant, relentless pursuit of growth um, is, um, is crucial. We see how quickly the market changes and how quickly anything can change, right? Anybody watching right now, just think of your, you know, the list of resolutions and plans you wrote for 2020. Ha ha, right? I was giving talks, you know, my last talk that I gave in person, I was talking about how, you know, this is the best uh, job market we've ever seen, you know, the war for talent. Hello, everything has changed. The rhetoric has changed. Um, so in order not to become, you know, rigid intellectually, you have to be in the constant growth mode, number one. And number two, um, you need to be able to communicate. You need to be able to speak and write. You just do. Um, you know, we're losing that with the younger generation because of the texting. And I know myself, because I'm so reliant on the spell check on my phone that whenever it's not working, I'm writing something. I'm like, that is gibberish. What am I pressing, right? <laughs> right. Uh, we're very reliant. But it's becoming essential because certainly, um, you know, with automation and with machine learning, a lot of the things are going to be done for us. But the ability to communicate and to think, that will never be taken away. So it's very important to always work on that. Okay. Um, so if you could go back in time 
um, to younger you just coming into things, um, what advice would you give yourself now that you have the wisdom of, of experience and entrepreneurship? Um, what might you have done differently? Um, I would have really chilled the F out, <laughs> but to give myself some, uh, you know, some credit, um, I was an immigrant. I'm an immigrant. I came to Canada. See how I said I was an immigrant, right? Because I'm like, now I fit in. I'm all good. I'm good. I'm, good. I'm, good. I'm part of everybody. Um, but I'm an immigrant. I came to Canada after high school. Um, I was born in the Soviet Union, grew up in Ukraine. So the whole process of fitting in and finding my voice, which is why I'm so passionate about helping other people find their voice and scale it. I didn't have a voice. As an immigrant with a very, very thick accent, nobody would have been, in, would have been interested, Josh, in interviewing me at that time right. or having me speak anywhere. Or I would start talking and people just wanted me to stop talking because that was very difficult to understand. Um, so it, it was really hard for me and it affected my self-esteem. It affected my confidence. I felt that, you know, this is forever. You know, when you're going through a hard time, you think this is forever, right? Yeah. I'm getting older, you know, I'm 20 now, <laughs> this is forever. Um, and then when you look back, you go, wow, I could have just enjoyed the ride and remembered all those stories, which now I get to share all around the world. My stories, you know, of struggling here and struggling there. Right. And they all became part of my full story and my rhetoric. Um, so my advice to myself, my advice to other young people is to always be learning. I would have told myself, keep learning, keep on your path. Yeah. Um, and it's not whatever's happening. It's just not forever. Yeah. And that's especially timely advice right now um, because there are a lot of people struggling. Um, and, you know, I went through my own, you know, mini little depression, um, but it won't last forever. And, you know, you got to, you got to get up and, and move forward. Um, so is there anything else that we haven't covered? And maybe there's a lot um, that you would like to, uh, to make sure it, it's important to talk about right now. Yeah, I would want to mention something because um, I'm speaking with so many people that are struggling right now. It breaks my heart. So many people. I'm speaking to people. I'm looking at their resume and I'm telling them and they're questioning themselves. They're thinking something is wrong with them right now, yeah. right? Because they're, they're struggling and they're not, not used to it. And I tell each one of them, I said, do you understand that a year ago we would not be having this conversation, right? Like you have a brilliant career. You are amazing. It's not you. It's, it's circumstantial, which is hard to think about. I went through my period too. You know, the first uh, weekend, couple of weekends, once the pandemic hit, I spent in bed. I was unable to crawl out. I was staring at the ceiling. I'm like, I'm losing everything. I am literally losing everything, right? I'm losing my employees. I'm losing my office. My clients are all closed their mandates i'm losing my clients i'm like i'm gonna be losing my house like what what else am i gonna be losing it was very very hard what helped me josh and what i do recommend to people and i never thought i would be giving this kind of advice because it's, it's not me but just to backtrack very quickly um the the few days before the pandemic hit actually the weekend that new york declared state of emergency i was in new york and i had gone to see simon Sinek huge fan of his work and he was uh, doing his uh, his uh, his talk the day actually that evening new york declared state of emergency he even like made a little joke about uh, covid you know and uh, we're all still here and we're like sitting there like sardines on top of each other's heads in the, in the theater um, but one thing that he said and it meant absolutely nothing to me because i said it's not typical um to not in alignment with my personality he said if ever you're struggling switch to the mindset of service and think of what you can do for others. And I'm like, oh, kumbaya, you know, I'm Soviet. I don't think of things like that, <laughs> you know, like what does he mean? That weekend that I was lying in bed, immobilized by everything that was going on that I mentioned to you. Um, the day after the first Monday, I went online. I'm telling you, I have no idea why I did this. And I wrote a post saying, if you're struggling right now because you lost your job or you don't know what the future holds and you want to talk, I'm here for you. Here's my calendar link, book a time to speak. Okay. Right. It really filled up. <laughs> the time really filled up. I cannot tell you how much that helped me through my darkest moment. Yeah. First of all, it forced me to crawl out of bed and put on a smile because I was there for other people. So I wasn't going yeah. to use that time to tell them how much I was freaking out about everything. Right. Um, I built amazing connections. I attracted clients. I got hired to help people 
carve out their authentic voice and scale it, the work that I'm doing right now. Right. All that happened, but that was not the intention. The intention was to help others. Um, so that would be one recommendation that I would give um, because Simon Sinek says so, so it must be right <laughs> because it actually <laughs> works be for me. <laughs> Well, that's good. Um, I, I've heard it from uh, several thought leaders, but you know, now is the time to service, not sell. Um, and I can speak from my own standpoint. You know, since we started this, it's been incredibly uplifting for me mentally um, to be able to talk to people and give good ideas and share ways that we can, you know, lift ourselves up, um, as opposed to just kind of wallow down below because that's really easy and it's a slippery slope too. Um, but when you can step up and help others, um, that's just it's priceless honestly it's also so inspiring to see how many people are doing that right now i didn't expect right. that you know i've shed a lot of tears and you know when camera is off i'm like this is so nice people are being so nice so many people reaching out to me and saying you know can i do anything for you people that i would hope through a call i would sure. message me after and say what can i do for you i didn't ask you but are you okay um, and uh, I think, you know, this whole pandemic situation has been rough, but it, it's really shining the light on the true essence of people. The not such good people <laughs> are really on full display right now, yeah. uh, but predominantly people have so much good in them. And I think that we're, we're really seeing it right now. Well, that's a perfect place to, uh, to, to pause. Um, so I want to thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for sharing these great ideas. Um, and I'd love to actually have you back um, down the road so we can kind of see how the market is evolving um, and how people are evolving with it. It would be a pleasure anytime. All right. Thank you very much, Marina. Thank you, Josh.